Hello and welcome to Sigma TV. Uh, my name is David Black. I'm with Continent Day Technologies and uh, joining me today is Mr. Andrew Lyman, um, who is the Executive Director of the Gambling Division of Her Majesty's Government of Gibraltar, otherwise known as the Regulator. And we are here today to talk about all things Gibraltar. So thank you for joining us, Andrew. It's great to see you again, albeit virtually. Oh, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to the, the chat. No, good, good. So how's everything in Gibraltar from the uh, just, you know, from the pandemic point of view, Andrew? How's, um, how are things looking in Gibraltar today? I think the... Obviously, the, the virus is still with us. Uh, we're still getting a small level of community infection, but the infection numbers have come down considerably. I haven't looked today, but it was only 16 infections as of yesterday. And the vaccination rate in Gibraltar is uh, very high. I think that's because it's a small jurisdiction, so nobody's uh, got an excuse not to travel to the vaccination centre. And that's been very well organised. And in fact... Um, uh, the government is uh, looking to extend the vaccination program uh, to include some uh, cross-border workers as well, um, because obviously, as you're aware, there is a lot of cross-border movement between Gibraltar and the Campo. So, uh, yeah, overall, um, it's looking optimistic. I've been back in the office now for the uh, uh, second week now. And as I said to you before, I'm old enough now to have had both of my Pfizer vaccines. <laughs> uh, that's good. No, that's that's great to hear. And obviously, our all our thoughts are with uh, with our our friends and colleagues in Gibraltar. Unfortunately, I can't be there and haven't been able to be there for some time. But um, it's good to hear that um, you know there's there's positive news. So that's super. So, Andrew, I guess in the, in in the the context of of Gibraltar and global pandemic and so on. There's also been uh, the matter of Brexit, I suppose, that has been uh, that has kept going throughout all of this. So, I think it would be useful for us all just to get your thoughts on, you know, Brexit and and the Gibraltar response over the last, uh, well, I suppose over the last two or three years. Yeah, well, I think it's well documented that uh, Brexit was not something uh, the people of Gibraltar wanted or or voted for. There was a strong uh, Remain vote here, uh, almost a unanimous Remain vote. Um, but uh, Gibraltar's part of the wider UK family, and, and so uh, Gibraltar's accepted its fate and, and now obviously has looked forward to, to being as constructive as it can with the, 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 the environment it's been left in. Um, I mean... Uh, yes, you're right, Gibraltar's been battered not only by COVID, but by um, Brexit uncertainty. And whilst EU business has migrated away from Gibraltar, I think the fact that there was a deal done at the 11th hour uh, before the end of the transition period uh, meant that uh, uh, frontier fluidity remained um, uh, something that you know, had, hadn't become a crystallised risk. So, you know, absent COVID restrictions, then the frontier is uh, free flowing. And of course, the other good news is that uh, all the parties, Spain, the UK and Gibraltar, have uh, agreed in principle to uh, a new treaty, which would have to be a treaty between the European Union um, and, and the UK. And, and that's in the process of negotiation with really a time limit of, uh, as I understand it, of June this year. Okay. No, that's... Uh... It has been quite uh, quite a journey, I suppose, for Gibraltar throughout all of that. But one thing I'm hearing, Andrew, is around the the Schengen uh, possibilities around Schengen, and you mentioned the frontier a moment ago. So, put Gibraltar or the fluidity across the border and the importance of that uh, cross border environment. So. What are your thoughts on Schengen? Is, is that something that's possible or what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the deal is a proposed treaty is probably on three levels. The first one is free movement of people across the border. And I think uh, all the parties involved want that. Uh, the, the second issue is whether or not there might be a local customs union, 
with the localized area uh, of Spain that, that, that borders Gibraltar, in which case that would mean free flow of goods. And that's a matter for consultation on both sides at the moment. And then the third issue is uh, Gibraltar be, becoming part of the wider Schengen area. Obviously, Spain would be the principal member state to administrate that. Um, uh, and there have been negotiations around how that might be administrated, not by Spanish officials, but by EU uh, customs and border officials, uh, uh, commonly known as Frontex. So if uh, that deal gets across the line, it will mean Gibraltar is perhaps an even more attractive location the, 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 than, it, than it is already, because it will mean that people who are resident in Gibraltar uh, may be able to travel relatively fr freely within the uh, Schengen area. So um, although it doesn't cure the issue of Gibraltar not being able to provide services into the EU, it does provide for greater levels of movement. And in a, in a, in a world where most gambling operators are co-located on a cross-jurisdictional basis, then that could mean that Gibraltar becomes more attractive as a gambling hub rather than less attractive. Mm. And you touched, that's really interesting, Andrew, and you touched on a second ago there, um, market access for services. So we'll come on to, to the gambling or gaming in, in, in a second. But, you know, what's, what's your view for market access for services? So we've talked about Brexit, we've talked about Schengen, we've talked about that, that travel fluidity and so on. But if we get to the point of services out of Gibraltar, what's, what's your instinct or what do you feel we may all might see uh, coming out of Gibraltar in the next five years, say? Yeah, I mean, uh, pl plainly, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of moving parts at the moment. For example, there are still debates between the EU and the UK and then Gibraltar regarding the status of data transfers to and from the the EU and, and there's a holding position with the UK at the moment um, and, and then I mean I, at the end of the day I think it's a reality that gambling companies who are based in Gibraltar will not be able to supply gambling services into the, U, into the EU from Gibraltar unless there's a, a significant change in the environment and some wider deal results from that so I mean the reality is I think Gibraltar's got to face the fact that uh, effectively this will be a hub for UK facing operators and for those that want to face into non-EU international jurisdictions. The majority of operators are now co-located, many of them in Malta, and they have moved their EU business from Gibraltar to Malta. So I don't even necessarily see Malta as a, as a rival hub, uh, that you know, Malta will be an EU hub for gambling services and Gibraltar will be a UK and non-EU international hub. So I think that's the settled position at the moment and the position I'm and I think everybody would be very pleasantly surprised to see uh, that, that uh, services could be supplied into the EU from Gibraltar. But I think that's looking unlikely at the moment, although uh, I think well, I think we've learned over the last few years never to say never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, and amidst all of that, Andrew, of course, you've got, um, you know, as the regulator in, in Gibraltar, you have to move with the times and regulation and so on and so forth. So in all of that sort of geopolitical context and so on, um, you have to then translate that into potential changes down the line. So is there, <clears throat> is there anything you can tell us about that at this stage? Yeah, I mean, the primary uh, objective is for Gibraltar to remain as a key uh, gambling hub. And that means it's got to be attractive, A, for the existing operators to stay here and, and be attractive for other operators to come into the jurisdiction. Uh, there is new legislation in the pipeline. Um, I, I'm sitting on a draft of uh, an, a new gambling act, um, which is all ready being reviewed externally by external lawyers uh, and plainly there will be some changes in that gambling act um, you know to to, to to ensure that a Gibraltar continues to be seen as a good jurisdiction for gambling in terms of anti-money laundering social responsibility etc but also attractive from a 
commercial point of view, and, 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 and certainly, David, you'll be familiar with the debates around um, uh, under the current legislation, uh, you know, technology has to be based in uh, Gibraltar, uh, whereas a number of other jurisdictions, including the UK and Malta, are more neutral on the location of technology. And since the Gambling Act 2005, of course, we've seen the emergence of um, hypercloud. So we're currently discussing with the industry the solutions that might, uh, you know, entail to, to, to maintain um, uh, A, the commercial interests of the infrastructure providers here, but also make sure that uh, Gibraltar is not marginalised any, in any way. And, and, and obviously, without being a, an anorak on this, as you know, I am now, and, and discussing every uh, element of the technical solution, it may well be that uh, we have a position where ultimately we, we leave the backstop as having to have your technology here, but we're much more flexible from a regulatory point of view on um, the, dif the different architectures you might be able to employ on a wide world basis, including a connectivity here to hypercloud. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Andrew. And in terms of, you know, the, just to take that a little bit broader again, uh, you know, you talked about Gibraltar as a hub, for example, and that's that's really important. So, you know, given the challenges and, the, you know, technological challenges and geopolitical challenges, what's your personal vision for economic development and, and regulation and gambling for Gibraltar? Where do you see this going in, in a decade's time, for example? Well, I mean, you know, Gibraltar's uh, dealt with um, issues before when uh, some of the doomsayers have sort of said it would be the end of Gibraltar as a gambling hub. For example, in two, four, 2014, the UK introduced point of consumption tax and everybody said that that would be the end of Gibraltar as a gambling hub and it wasn't, it sustained and in, indeed it, it grew. And, and Brexit, again, the doom says uh, 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 that, you know, there's been a line that it'd be the end of Gibraltar as a gambling hub. It's, we, we, we're not seeing that. I, I think um, Gibraltar traditionally has been built, uh, the gambling industry has built, been built around big blue chip operators. And obviously we want those to sustain here, if not grow. But I think Gibraltar also has to be now slightly less risk averse but with making sure that it, it, it lets the right sort of business into Gibraltar. Gibraltar has been, always been selective and I think it will still remain selective. But obviously we've got to attract operators here who want to face into non-EU international jurisdictions. We still want to retain obviously operators who face into the UK. Um, and obviously I think we need to ensure that Gibraltar sustains as a, as a hub by attracting more startup business more of the technology supply chain, more B2B suppliers. And um, I mean, as things stand, I'm quite optimistic because we, we do have, um, it'll have to be on a no names basis at the moment, we do have a small queue of B2C licensees and B2B licenses still wanting to license in, in, the, in the jurisdiction. So I think it's unlikely that we're going to see the arrival of a great huge gambling behemoth into Gibraltar. Um, I'll do my best to persuade some of those companies to come here. But I think what we're more likely to see is more sort of smaller and agile companies, perhaps with, you know, 30 staff to start off with, um, perhaps, um, you know, running their business on a multi-jurisdictional basis, but seeing Gibraltar as the right place for its senior management for the so mind the management comes from here, et cetera. So I think it is, it, 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 it's slowly building out by having a good offering but making sure that what we don't do is take all comers and undermine the good regulatory reputation that Gibraltar has. Um, I certainly don't want that to happen on my watch and, and neither does the minister as, um, uh, as, uh, as licensing authority. So yeah, picking the right propositions, but you know, getting across the message that Gibraltar is absolutely open for gambling business. And, that, and if you've got a credible proposition and you're committed to anti-money laundering and social responsibility then you know we'd be more than happy to c consider that proposition and and license where appropriate yeah no that's that's good to hear andrew um it's interesting when uh there are about on your watch so i was just thinking this morning it's probably almost exactly three years since we met um and during that time, as we as we opened up our our chat today about you know the the global pandemic, Brexit, regulatory changes, and so on and so forth, what's your personal journey been like, Andrew? Have you 
enjoyed the experience of all these things? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I can sit here now three years on and say absolutely it was the right decision for my wife and I to come to Gibraltar. It's a fantastic jurisdiction with a, a lot of lifestyle benefits. I mean, plainly COVID's got in the in the way this this year, but you know, at my great age, uh, curfews and not going out are not necessarily a bad thing, to be honest. So I'm better off than some of my uh, younger colleagues, quite honestly. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, th th there is still stuff to do here. Um, you know, we we're getting through COVID. Uh, we're finding our way through uh, Brexit. I'm surprised at how stable I think the jurisdiction still is in terms of being a gambling hub. Uh, I've had some days of pessimism where I thought things might take a turn for the worse, but really thanks to government support, government policy, et cetera, and perhaps sometimes even a lucky break, then you know things have sustained very well here. I, I've not got the impression that anybody's going to march off the rock. People still want to come here. And this is actually, to be honest, if I reflect on it, a much bigger job than I thought it would be. It's not just about regulation. For me, it's about politics with a small p, uh, m making sure that I understand the political climate in, in which I regulate, understanding Brexit, um, understanding the implications of COVID for our firms and all the business continuity arrangements they've had to be put in place, understanding that what we can do as regulators, for example, approving more virtual and gaming content when, uh, when sports uh, content was diminished was an important area. We've always kept going despite all the Brexit and COVID issues. Uh, you know, this office has always maintained a, a, you know, a fair rate of work. So, and, and to be honest, I mean, I suppose three years down the line, some might dispute this, David, but I think I'm now a better regulator in year three than I was in year one. And, and, and hopefully, uh, because that's experience more than anything else, and, and uh, the knocks that you take and the lessons that you learn to often sometimes from, from making uh, decisions that you wish you hadn't made uh, or, or, or making mistakes that, that you then have to undo. So, so I hope I've kept the ship reasonably upright. And um, as I say, with the introduction of the new legislation, and building, help build the economy in Gibraltar, because gaming is about 25% of the GDP here, then, you know, I wouldn't say that the weight of responsibility bears down on me, but I think I've got an, for as long as I'm here, and as long as the government want me here, then I've obviously got an important role to play, not just in regulation, but helping to rebuild the economy as well. Yeah, no, well, it's, it's, it's interesting, Andrew, for, the continent A clearly is an investor in Gibraltar. Um, and, but one thing that has always struck me, and a number of places are like this, but it becomes very apparent in Gibraltar, is that sense of community, I suppose. It's, it's, and yes, there's population-wise, it's not an enormous uh, population. Uh, and one would expect a level of, of you know, social proximity uh, under normal circumstances. But there is genuinely, I feel, even as an investor in Gibraltar, there is genuinely a, a sense of community about Gibraltar that in, in many ways feels unique. Do, do, you, do you see some truth in what I'm saying there, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, and plainly there are stresses and strains at times, and 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 you no, know, uh, you know, commercial companies are never going to agree with the regulator at all, all stages. But I, I get the impression, uh, certainly in the time that I've been here, that all of the different stakeholders, particularly in the gambling industry here, are genuinely batting for Gibraltar PLC. I, I mean, plainly, you know, if people can sh shave amounts off their tax yield or or get the infrastructure they want or optimize their business that they, they they will do but i generally feel that the majority of people are rowing in the same uh, direction um and so a fellow regulator who shall remain nameless once said to me well how do you balance the two how do you balance you know being a regulator and also being supportive of the uh the community which you regulate and and the answer is um, by building mutual trust. We're not an enforcement-led regulator. We're a, definitely a compliance-led regulator. And I, I think, you know, we, you can build a relationship with the industry. You need to learn from the industry anyway, you know, to keep up with technology and other industry developments. So 
if you're not close to the industry, you're not developing as a regulator. And the only time that you ever need to, uh, you know, have an enforcement led approach is if, if there's a breach of trust between you and one of the regulated communities, they, you know, they don't deliver on the promises that, 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 that they've, they've made you to, to rectify whatever control failures they may have even self reported, for example. So I, I, it's, it, it, it's quite a healthy uh, environment, I think. Um, others may think differently. And, and, and I, I, I found that it's not that difficult to be able to balance the role of regulator and the role of industry supported to a degree, whilst recognizing that the industry, you know, does have faults and does need to develop in certain areas. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andrew, it's been a pleasure, uh, as always. I'm only sorry we haven't been able to to see each other in person over the last number of months for obvious reasons. But it's been a pleasure and thank you for thank you for joining on Sigma TV today and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Well thank, well, thank you very much and uh, thank you for letting me put the case with you, Gibraltar and uh, I'll look forward to sharing a glass of red wine for you in the future. That'll be lovely, that'll be lovely. So again, thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's watched today. I hope that was of some benefit. Um, I'd like to thank Andrew again and Sigma TV for um, for hosting us today and uh, stay safe and hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thank you.